The title is, as you know, Reflecting on the Politics of Animal Liberation. Since the end of the short 20th century, political moves, movements aimed at challenging the prevailing doxa were under attack and started to retreat. Um, slowly but in inexorably, the democratic resources, the legal protections, and the welfare provisions, which are the outcome of, of past struggles, were eroded even in the few lucky nations where exploitation and repression are not openly, openly avoid in the so-called Western democratic countries. Anti-war demonstrations are disappearing. Self-proclaimed leftist parties put themselves at the service of neoliberal market fundamentalism. And anti-globalization movements are silenced. All this while Radical leftist thinkers, confronted with the fragmentation of the traditional social landscape, with the disappearance of the traditional working class, seem able to produce only dubious political abstractions, granting a key structural role to the material labor embodied by multitudes composed of diverse political actors, for example, Tony Negri, and Michael Hart, or for the foreboding the intervention of miraculous events, causing the emergence in history of eternal thoughts, Alain Badiou, or even appealing to redemptive repetitions of past insurgency, insurgencies meant to relieve their full utopian potential. And this is Slavoj Žižek. In contrast, the animal movement keeps growing and spreading even in countries traditionally impervious to it. New groups appear all over the world and international links are created to fight new struggles. While the causes of this anomaly are still to be investigated, just as it should be investigated why the explosion of animal exploitation after World War II uh, accompanied an exceptional period of social progress in Western countries. This is a, a, a really puzzling contradiction. One reason at least seems clear. The recent intellect, intellectual debate of animals, of which this conference is uh, part, of course, by conferring the objectivity of public theory to a perspective on the world previously relegated to the state of a, of a tacit or confused experience, has had the power to arouse formerly censored feelings and tendencies and to capitalize on them. But what, of what animal movement exactly are we speaking? Mostly of the traditional reformist one, aiming at eliminate, eliminating some forms of exploitation and at softening the brutality of some practices, endeavors which, despite the new forms of militant uh, or mobiliz mobilization, and despite the positive aspect of producing a sort of background noise favorable to animals, which might even partially affect the legal context and pave the way for more radical requests, are still somehow heirs to the tradition of protectionist societies appealing to compassion rather than justice. In the face of this, it can be argued that the animal liberation movement, whose goal is animal equality and the end of non-human exploitation, has two main tasks, fully in the wake of other great political movements. First, it should intensify the use of theory, chiefly in the form of philosophical approaches, just as we are doing here, to develop critical arguments and to identify and expand the regulative ideas and the key interpretive concepts, giving substance to the ongoing struggle. Second, and perhaps more controversially, in view of the fact that some section of political movements are committed to a kind of anti-intellectualism, according to which one should not devote time and energy to argue and theorize, it should theoretically articulate 
the level of concrete political choices, of strategic orientation and of policy formulations. As mentioned, the present explosion of the animal movement was fostered by the intellectual debate which granted the issue the, granted, sorry, the, issue, the objectivity of an official theory. Actually, the idea of equality for animals was developed at the beginning of the 1970s within the context of analytic ethics in conjunction with a general reflection on intra-human equality. The impressive work of theorization of those years provided the movement with unassailable rational tools, which still are the backbone of any challenge to the existing humanist order and which undermined the position long taken for granted. Uh, of course, um, uh, in, contrary to my will, I wasn't here before, but I read the abstracts and I think I say I can agree with David Olivier's um, idea that we uh, must uh, not go back to the fundamentals, but keep the fundamentals in our minds. Uh, not try to forget uh, uh, what has been produced in those years. So, uh, among them, one should, should number at least, among the views that had been um, criticized and undermined, the view that a moral community can be structured on the basis of specific belief systems rooted in sub super scientific explanation of things. Uh, this has happened uh, uh, almost for all uh, the history of Western philosophy. Just to give you an example, um, black people or non-Western people were deemed to be inferior on the basis of, of religious or metaphysical worldviews, uh, which created a, a, a hierarchical view uh, in which those who, who should be exploited, who, who the powerful wanted to exploit, were defined as inferior. Uh, another is the agent patient parity principle, or according to which the class of moral patients, the beings whose treatment may be morally evaluated, coincides with the class of moral agents. The beings whose behavior may be morally evaluated. This is uh, uh, the Kantian view, but it, exist, uh, it existed for long uh, before Kant. The idea uh, is that only those who can act morally deserve moral consideration. It, it is enough to think of the, the, the weaker among us, uh, for example, of uh, disabled people, to understand uh, that it's, uh, it's incredible that we had uh, stick to such a view for so many centuries. Um, the perfectionist approach which grants a heavy moral weight to the possession of demanding cognitive capacities such as rationality and autonomy. And this is, in this case, uh, the, the, it holds the same critique uh, because it's uh, really unthinkable that uh, individuals who are weaker because they are less uh, cognitively endowed can be treated uh, as inferior, inferiors. And uh, la, the, uh, the contractarian perspective uh, revolving around uh, the idea of reciprocity, this is another trick of Western philosophy. Reciprocity sounds very well. The, the idea is um, it's fair to treat people uh, as they treat you. But this can hold only uh, with, uh, at the same level because, of course, a weaker individual cannot reciprocate, but it's not harming you, it's not unfair to you. So the principle of reciprocity is really a mockery when referred to weaker beings. Um, and finally, all the forms of biologies according to which individuals can be morally discriminated against on the ground of their membership in, particular biological group, in a particular biological group, that is racism, sexism, and, of course, speciesism, 
which is at the center of our discussions. However, in spite of its radicalism and, uh, and of the attempted association with other rad radical causes, such a reflection remained mainly an academic undertaking. And while various publications and journals think only of, of ethics and animals in, uh, in the United States and also, for example, between the species and so on, partially bridged the gap between the new animal ethics and the contemporary forms of activism, there was nothing analogous to the historical penetration of the social question into the working class. Indeed, analytic philosophers, despite their theoretical radicality, lacking a robust analysis of the links between ethics and politics, were hardly politically equipped to articulate a challenge to establish the social institutions. As Matthew Calarco noticed, their strategy was often the same one that is dominated in applied ethics, that is, defend what is taken to be the more cogent ethical theory, apply it to animals, and simply let the political implications of that approach fall into place. Thus, after an impressive commencement, the question ended up becoming the topic of abstract disputes and the animal ethics sources started drying up. Then, after a period of quiescence, the subject matter of animals reappeared in different realms, first in the form of animal studies, and then in the form of critical animal studies. In spite of some common features, such as an expansion of the discourse, both at the level of the involved dis disciplines, they always speak of interdisciplinarity. And at the level of the focal issue, embracing in general human-animal relationships, rather than focusing uh, on animal liberation, it, it can be argued that only critical animal studies, the second uh, current, uh, with their stronger social commitment, their definite leftist slant, favoring a renewed attempt to merge the cause of animals uh, with, other, with other social causes and their politi politi politici politicization of the politicized issue, sorry, can be seen as serious animal liberation theorization. Actually, in contrast with animal studies, characterized by that scholastic view which is marked by a freedom from necessity which is li liable to raise a speculative problems merely for the problems, for the pleasure of resolving them. This had a name, an expression scholastic view came, comes from Austin and used by Pierre Bourdieu, but at, uh, at the beginning of the movement's reflection, there, there was an, another term, simpler but very effective, the academic connection. No? The, the, the idea that uh, abstraction uh, uh, replaced uh, 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 social commitment. Uh, critically, in, contrary to this, critical animal studies adopt an explicit political approach, as made clear by the, their institutional focus and by their critique of capitalism, imperialism and interrelated forms of hierarchical oppression. Unluckily, however, the social impact of such a discourse was limited by the difficulty due, among other things, to the absence of a universal greed, like the one offered by rational ethics, of overcoming the risk of preaching to the converted, of not being able to reach a, a wider audience. Finally, in the last period, one can see the rise of a new field of reflection in which political philosophy and thinking directly entered the scene of discussion. Such a change was clearly prompted by the work of Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka, who, with their envisaging of a future zoopolis in which animals are granted political recognition, citizenship if they live among us, sovereignty if they live in their own territories, and a form of denizenship or partial, partial citizenship if their communities overlap with human communities, uh, think of rats, uh, pigeons, and so on, raccoons, have applied to the Newman case 
the full apparatus of contemporary liberal political philosophy, offering a lesson in universality and consistency. What is now defined, the political turn, quotation marks, in animal philosophy, however, has not followed the course outlined by Donaldson and Kimmelkamp. In fact, advancing a right-wing interpretation of their work, which privileges relational considerations over the argument about equal value, some liberal authors have opted not to endorse interspecies egalitarianism, seen as a too lofty a philo a philosophical position. In other words, they revive species. We must go to the fundamentals. Thus, arguing that their position is more practical and realistic because it does not imply the risk of overriding democratic procedures and because it may not be unrealistic to get the majority of the public to accept it, they defend a position that focuses, once again, on the traditional welfare, welfareist mini, minimization of animal suffering. In the face of this, uh, one cannot avoid thinking of Eric Hobsbawm, the author of The Short Century, observation that while the political realists of appeasement with Nazism were entirely unrealistic in their assessment of the situation. A, while they were anti, anti, uh, unrealistic, the real unrealistic statements, the only realistic statements on the question of Germany was Winston Churchill who wanted to fight. So, Sometimes, uh, when they say, when they tell us it's more realistic to retreat, to ask for less, and so on, we must think that probably the most realistic position is to go straight uh, to the goal and try to obtain what we, where, what we want to obtain. Um, thus, uh, though it must be admitted that liberal thinkers at least consider the, consider the animal question as a political issue, differently from those neo-Marxist authors who, totally forgetful of, for instance, the children and disability rights movement, claim that since the oppressed cannot become free if they do not develop their own political project through their own agency, it is both wrong and paternalistic to fight in the name and on behalf of subjugated animals. This is more specific, specifically Michael Hart, but it's a, an idea which is present in the leftist area. Uh, so while um, though uh, um, uh, they are better, liberal thinkers are better than neo-Marxist thinkers, unfortunately the result of their political position, fra far from furthering the liberation of non-humans, is a retrograde step with respect to the previous ethical discourse to the beginning, with respect to the beginning. It is thus important to take up the matter afresh. A political movement really begins to exist when theory permeates practice so as to create a unified whole, able to decode reality with the aim of changing it. It is no coincidence that, for example, in the leftist political tradition, veritable political battles were fought around major theoretical stances. Think only of the controversies in the approach to the state, alternatively seen as an institution whose supreme law is the augmentation of its power, uh, so that one should aim at abolishing it altogether. And this was, for example, Bakunin. Uh, or, or uh, as the embodiment of the unity of individuals in an ethical wall, so that one should aim at reforming it. For example, LaSalle felt this. Uh, given the centrality of theory, it is a general tendency of newly emerging social movements to draw inspiration from the ingrained ideologies of the forces that preceded them. Most of the 19th and 20th centuries movements, for instance, spoke the language of the French Revolution. But the animal liberation movement's cause has remained in the dark for such a long time. The only vaguely analogous situation is perhaps that of human slavery. 
and its proposal so much outthrown the whole actual experience of recent ages that it is rather problematic to borrow from previous currents of thought. Yet, uh, there are still possibilities. It is such possibility that in an, in an exercise of anticipatory political imagination, this uh, is uh, uh, a phrase by Marcuse, which I think uh, is, very, is, is very strong. Uh, in, ex in an exercise of anticipatory political imagination, a renewed discussion should aim at exploring for interpretive grids can be adapted, forms of organization can be extrapolated, and novel synthesis can be attempted. A recent debate engaged in, in this enterprise. Different theoretical stances were applied to the animal question, and their relevant implications for praxis were articulated. We shall consider the main contribution to the discussion before presenting an alternative vision. The, uh, and the, view I, the views I shall present are some of the view, views uh, which have been articulated in the book uh, uh, which was mentioned before, uh, Philosophy and the Politics of Animal Liberation, four of these views. Uh, the original perspective, de perspective developed by Matthew Calarco waged an attack on that notion of species which is at the center of our discussion and that since the start of the animal debate has been a powerful instrument for the crit critique of the humanist paradigm due to the immediate parallel with the racism and sexism it evokes, it establish, establishes. The basic theoretical tool, tool through which such an attack is waged is the concept of anthropocentrism, a concept that has known great popularity in environmental ethics but that has now taken on an additional, more complex meaning. The feature of the notion that is stressed both by the old and by the new construal is the idea that human beings are the most sin significant entities in the world. This is uh, the basis of the notion of anthropocentrism. To this, however, in consonance with some radical strains of feminist thought, the view has been added that anthropocentrism embodies a network of ideas, structures and practices aimed at establishing and reproducing the privileged status of those who are deemed to be fully and quintessentially human, that is not of the human species as such, but of a small subset of beings belonging in the species. Um, this is very important, of course, uh, you can see here the link between theory and praxis. Uh, from this uh, uh, construal of the situation issues a political conclusion. A corollary of this construal is that the dominion over and the exploitation of non-human beings is embedded in a web of oppression, also embracing various sorts of discriminated human individuals or, or groups. As a consequence, the political implication of such a discourse is that, that the struggle for animal justice cannot be fought in an independent way, but must instead draw force and insights from the cooperation with other radical social movements. Thus, the movement strategy of resistance should focus on interlocking systems of power and should therefore include among its tactics an involvement in those alternative minoritarian cultures which strive to overcome productivism and commodification by contesting the, the practices that negatively impact animals, humans and the environment. The attention, this attention to other movements for social justice is also present in the approach developed by, once again, Sue Donaldson and Wynne Kimlicka, who participated in this uh, debate who, after outlining the future of Zoopolis, have sought to articulate a path towards such a political end state by exploring new possible intersections as well as new normative proposals for a society which might include non-human subjects as citizens. Such an approach implies the development of a praxis for social change concretely shaped by principles rooted in the leftist, the egalitarian wing of contemporary liberalism, and strongly critical of the burgeoning rightist libertarian dogmas. 
and produces a discourse which embraces clear strategic suggestions. In this perspective, in contrast to the, uh, these are two among the various critiques that uh, those sympathetically uh, are, are uh, mm, advanced uh, against the, uh, the, the present movement by Donaldson and Kimlicka. In this perspective, in contrast to the excessive focus on individual conversions and to the tendency of many organizations to act like business corporations, so this is particularly um, um, common in the United States, but also in other, in other countries, of course. An effective movement should start from a reshaping of local communities, so the focus is on local communities, and employing a bottom-up procedure should engage in the proce process of institutional change as an integral part of the broader social justice movement. Once again, from from the general theoretical position, issues the idea that we should, uh, that the movement should work with other radical movements. Um, within this framework, the strategic suggestions advanced are unified by a specific theoretical model, that of community building, a political choice, by the way, also favored by authors concerned with contrasting the Anthropocene disaster in the form of nodal niches or points in a decentralized archipelago sharing principles of human-animal justice. Uh, of course, uh, we cannot avoid noting that this is uh, a, a view, a, a choice uh, uh, that uh, has existed for a long time. Foucault teaches us that counter-communities were diffused in medieval times. The idea that it is possible to change society by creating, creating small knots, uh, which are very different and which can uh, erode the paradigm, is an old idea, but it's always an important idea, of course. By creating and diffusing new lived lived environments, linking animal defense to ideas of democratic re renewal, such a community building may lead in the long term to the creation of a global interspecies community, political community, sorry. Rather distant from this categorical read are instead the stances drawing their origin from that biopolitical discourse which articulated a view according to, to which this essence and or the developments of Western politics revolve not around the liberal uh, idea of agreement, as we are normally told, but around the sovereign subjugation of humans, not only as political beings, but also as mere living things, biopolitics, uh, politics of bios, of life. In, in the negative sense, so uh, you, you can use the term biopol biopolitical thinking for the, the critique of biopolitics as a practice. Using Foucauldian, to theore Foucauldian to theoretical tools, for example, Dinesh Wodiwell develops a perspective according to which war, war is the concept that best, best captures the nature of our construct, constant structured violence against animals. It is just the continuing victory in this unbalanced war against resisting but weaker beings, not any pre-existing superiority, that grants humans that sovereignty over non-humans, which, which allegedly warrants a right to use and consume them as an exclusive form of property. In this context, it cannot be surprising that that form of governmental, governmentality or management of individuals through techniques and dispositives that completely ca capture life, whose extreme intra-human manifestations are concentration camps or, more recently, detention centers, as its origin and paradigmatic manifestation in the institutional sites of violence where animals are literally kept at the threshold of life and death. Is there any chance to challenge this integrated oppressive system? According to Wadi, well, two political tools here stand out for consideration. One is counterconduct, that is, a sort of insubordination 
against that which exists, the main, main instance of which is the practice of veganism, not as a form of personal asceticism, but as a means to disrupt systemic violence and, once again, as a mechanism for building alternative communities. What he well mentions, uh, uh, uses uh, um, Foucault's work a lot and mentions uh, also the heretic communities uh, in, the, uh, in the Middle Ages. The second tool is the hypothesis, hypothesis of a truce. One day without killing animals, one day when the slaughterhouse houses shut down and when we might imagine a space for a different ethical relationship. This is an idea which uh, um, well, um, avowedly borrows from Andrea Dworkin, which uh, during a, a, a speech to an audience composed by uh, 500 men and maybe two or three women, uh, uh, addressed this man and said, uh, work with us for a day of truth, uh, for a day without uh, violence against women. Wadiwell uh, introduces this idea into the, the possi po possible praxis of the movement. It is und und undeniable that this strategy, even as a thought experiment, is quite ambitious. It has, however, two relevant merits. The first one is the fundamental symbolic relevance of focusing not on consumers, but on the production, production process of killing animals, those operating explicitly on an institutional level. The second one is the fact that in this attempt to temporarily disarm sovereignty, animal advocates might look for support from other transforma transformational movements, and in particular from those workers who are the exploited section of the exploitive uh, system. Here is really, in a sense, uh, we feel that, sorry, that it's really a utopian idea. The idea is that the workers of the slaughter houses, houses sorry, uh, can support this idea of, of uh, a day of truth. But it's, it's really symbolically powerful and, and it's, we cannot exclude it. We cannot exclude it. Maybe it's, it is worth uh, working for this. The problem of the re realizability of the movement's political goals lies at the core of a further perspective which goes straight to the question, it's the fourth perspective apart from uh, mine which I will present, pointing at a rational radical stance which might produce a critical confrontation with asymmetrical power relations. Such a perspective perspective advanced by Gregory Smolevich Zucker incorporates a strong Hegelian influence in the form of the idea that rights only become actual, actual when they are institutionalized by the state um, so that political movements can be seen as means of pressuring the state to establish and extend rights. The defense of the role of the state as a possible ally in the struggle for intra and uh, interspecific justice, a defense that somehow reactivates the mentioned controversies uh, we have we have stressed uh, the discussion about the state uh, in uh, the in the first international and the second international in the Marxist and anarchist era uh, with the associated idea that it is the law which can drive the right of social progress prompts a rejection of all the theoretical perspectives marked by a total lack of political direction and in particular of postmodernism and posthumanism, a rejection which is widely diffused within the, the movement, within the, the intellectual discu discussion in the movement, and is shared, for example, by scholars as different as the liberal Gary Steiner and the left oriented uh, Sipora Weisberg. What would an effective animal rights politics would look like on this view? The main shift should revolve around the key notion of pressure, 
all the factors at play, whatever the differences between them, should cooperate to pursue one single aim, the aim of compelling the state to grant legal rights to non-human beings. Thus, uh, through the focus on a strategic line, which is distinctly centripetal, what is defended by Smolovich Zucker is a clear alternative to a traditional centrifugal perspectives, priv privileging public involvement and our outreach programs. Uh, I've reached the last section. Uh, are you tired? Do you want to me? Do you want me to to make a pause? It's okay. No, because. I'm going like a train and maybe it's not a good idea. Uh, do you prefer to... F what, what does uh, the organization suggest? Hmm? Va bene. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. I I'll go on. Thanks. Different from the previous authors, Smulevich Zucker defends the independence of the animal liberation movement and envisaged as a strong, autonomous entity, pursing it, its specific goals. So does uh, the approach that I favor, on which we shall, shall dwell on some depth. Such an approach essentially focuses on the search of a perspective in the literal sense of a theoretical vanishing point, whose effect of convergence might, might give unity to dispersed political activities. Uh, the discovery of perspective in the animal movement's uh, politics, not figures disposed uh, side by side, but the attempt uh, to have something which connects uh, all the forts uh, and uh, all the, the ideas of the movement. According to such a view, those aiming at the liberation of non-human animals must confront the combined effects of the ingrained ideology of human superiority and of capitalism as a mode of production based on global commodification. In the face of this scenario, it is argued two approaches, uh, the Frankfurtian's critical theory with its challenge to the reifying power of instrumental reason and Pierre Bourdieu's reflexive sociology with its deconstruction of the, of the symbolic violence of the dominant might offer some guidance. For through their common stress on the essential role of theory as an instrument able both to interpret reality and to modify it, they can provide an integrated view whose theoretical insights and suggestions for praxis may be profit profitably adapted to the context of the animal question. On the one hand, the critical theory, uh, the Frankfurt School, uh, Adorno, Urkheimer, uh, um, uh, from, uh, and then Marcuse and so on. Um, on, on the one hand, uh, critical theory centers on the idea, blamed by some for its negative pathos, uh, for example, by uh, Slavoj Žižek, uh, Žižek, that capitalism is just one, even if perhaps, perhaps the most impressive, among the expressions of a more fundamental phenomenon, the dominion of that instrumental reason, which does not hesitate to turn even subjects into objects, and which, as the agency of calculating thought, apprehends everything in terms of manipulation and administration. Parenthesis, sorry, <laughs> in brackets. By the way, it should be noted that uh, rare aves uh, in the leftist tradition, Adorno and Orkheimer, include animals among the manipulated subjects. And since in the face of late capitalism's celebration of the final enthronement of the means as, an end, as the end, it was difficult, and since in the face of late capitalism, sorry, celebration of the final enthronement of the means as the end, it was difficult to detect an immediate possibility of profound social change. Remember that uh, the, the magnum opus uh, it, uh, was, uh, was written by Orkheimer and Adorno uh, when Nazis was still in place, and that they came from the experience of Nazis on, on one side and the, the, 
the disappointment of the revol revolutionary hopes uh, raised by uh, the Soviet Revolution. So it was difficult not uh, to have a negative pathos. Um, stressed that, um, it was difficult to detect any immediate possibility of profound social change. After and contra Marx, in was wake uh, they operated, the Fra Frankfurtians stressed the fundamental relevance of the substructural, superstructural factor of ideology and favored the strong commitment to theory view, viewed as one as sometimes the only possible form of praxis, able to nurture the seeds of an immanent critique which might detect the social contradictions offering possibilities for emancipatory change. The ability theory gives us the ability to find the nodal points where we can put pressure, where there are more possibilities of changing the situation. The immanent critique is immanent because it starts from that which exists and tries to derive suggestions for praxis from that which exists. Uh, and when, in a later period, the Students' Rebellion and the Third World's Liberation Movements fostered new hopes, it fell to Herbert Marcuse to offer concrete instructions for a praxis focused on a cultural struggle, giving priority to the subjective factor and operationalizing it in terms of the oppositional consciousness of a militant minority. The oppositional consciousness of a militant minority. It's the definition of our work, it's the definition of the animal liberation movement. Of course, Marcuse was not thinking of us. <laughs> On the other hand, Pierre Bourdieu's reflexive sociology, a perspective, perspective that, due to its Nietzschean emphasis on the intrinsic social conflict over power and prestige, can also be seen as marked by a negative pathos. I call it, in this case, I really call it realism. Mm -hmm. Offers a comprehensive anthropological view according to which whatever its ideological or economic configuration, any society is the locus of struggles for power and status that can be predicated on something even more general than instrumental reason, a sort of will to power, a Nietzschean will to power. Uh, it's not uh, declared uh, so clearly by Bourdieu. According to such a view, the centrality of competition, both at the level of the division of the work of domination, among the sexes, the classes, etc., and within the context of the various fields making up the social space, and the fact that the winners in the social competition impose their power on the losers, imply that the tendency to hierarchization and oppression is congenital to the entire social universe. Here, too, Domination is seen as only partially based on direct violence and economic power. Since, Bourdieu argues, if hierarchical societies often work smoothly, it is because they embody the habitus, a principle of continuity, which leads individuals to take the world for granted, or a system of structured and structured instructors that, embedded in every member of the group, crucially engages the doxas, or what goes without saying, because it is both subjectively internalized and inscribed in the objective. When we um, uh, wonder about the difficulty of convincing people when the argument seems so clear to us, uh, what we are really fighting against, it's not normally, it's not what people think, it's the habitus, it's what uh, has been embodied, and, and Bourdieu uh, emphasizes that uh, embodied is uh, used here in the literal sense. 
It's part of the body. It's part, he speaks, for example, of uh, table manners. Uh, of un, an, an incredible example is the, the one referring to um, contemporary girls uh, wearing um, trousers uh, and uh, uh, flat uh, shoes working like this because women have been taught for centuries to walk uh, with difficulty because they had to be controlled. This is a, a brilliant example of how the habitus is incorporated. So, for, uh, for the question of eating animals, of treating animals in, in one way rather than another, uh, the, the power of the habitus is incredible. And also, we, we must think that to fight the power of the habitus, uh, uh, we need a powerful theoretical reflection because uh, when Bourdieu writes uh, structured and structuring structures, uh, it, it seems a, 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 a difficult phrase, he, he, he says uh, simply that the habitus is embodied and once it is embodied, it goes on working on the external reality. So, we are structured when we are young from our culture, from our family and so on. And since what we, we, we have interjected finds a, a, a sort of mirror in the external reality, we feel that we are right and we go on repeating and uh, reaffirming what uh, we have been taught. So we are structured, but we go on structuring. And so all those who think that animals do not count, that animals are inferior beings, or oh, um, why do you care they are animals, are not really in general thinking. They are simply uh, manifesting this, the societal habitus. Okay. Hello. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> and uh, um, all this is clear in agreement with the Franco Frankfurtian idea that hierarchy and oppression are strongly dependent, dependent on broadly cultural factors, and that, and that if the process whereby the social order extorts acceptance of its existing hierarchies is an imposition of systems of meaning that legitimize the structures of inequality, the no dominated can react through culture by questioning the prevailing grids of classification and interpretation. In other words, theory here too can be seen as both subordinate to the given and capable of transcending it, especially at the junctures when external causal series introduce histories which mechanisms of reproduction tend to resist into societies and fields. Thanks to culture, then, opposition to power, though difficult, is not impossible. <coughs> and the philosophically problematized sociological analysis, interested in the demystification of the status quo, can offer political tools to movements informed, if not by millenarian hopes, at least by realistic utopias. All in all then, despite the obvious differences, uh, there is a crucial converg convergence between critical theory and reflexive sociology. Both, approachally, sorry, both approaches essentially believe that theory can have a transgressive use, and both hold that it can play a therapeutic role against repression, be it by imagining the uh, unimaginable or by disturbing seemingly natural distinctions. In other words, starting from the plausible assumption that if the capitalist mode of production is the structural element in the current exploitation of other animals, and humanism is the, is the superstructural factor, what the two interpretations briefly outlined tell us in different ways and appealing to different explanations is first that the superstructural factor is far more important than was traditionally thought. 
traditionally thought. And second, that at this level, unlike what happens at the structural level, where the disparity of forces is overwhelming, political dissenters are not unarmed. And this because theory, both in the passive sense of offering a lucid construal of reality and in the active sense of offering instruments for intervention, is a powerful resource accessible even to the politically disadvantaged. It should now be easy to perceive the affinity of such approaches with the political enterprise of the animal liberation movement, an enterprise that already hindered by the lack of a decisive backing from the nominated group, must confront an extreme unfolding of instru instrumental reason and a vice, vast exercise of symbolic violence largely supported by mobilization of cultural resources. But what are the specific strategic ideas one can tentatively draw from the theoretical stances in question? Apropos of the importance uh, of uh, a structural theory for the, the dominated, uh, I want to recall once again that what is happening starting from uh, the end of the short century, sorry, uh, that is the destruction of the social democratic and leftist uh, movements started from the demolition of the cultural resources of these movements. Um, some 20 years ago, no, more than 20 years ago, the left dominated cultural, cultural some countries, Italy, for example, France too, not the United States, but there was a strong leftist uh, series of uh, authorities, and slowly they were deprived of their status, uh, their uh, organization and journals started to close, and this was the beginning of the economic destruction, political and economic destruction of these movements. Here are some suggestions that might hopefully provide a basis for discussion. In a Frankfurtian perspective, a first step might be to focus on sorting out society's internal dialectics so as to identify tendencies that might lead beyond the existing state of affairs. As Marcuse puts it, to gain success, attempts to end intolerable con conditions must imply that the logic involved, the, or involved in the movement of thought and action is that of the given conditions to be transcended. In this light, a praxis infused with theory will try to take advantage of the existing suppressed contradictions by activating them and making them operate as catalysts of change as well as by using the available instruments to guide them in the desire, desired political direction. In brackets, Lenin would, have, would add that the art of politics likes in, lies in finding and taking a firm grip of the links that are the least, least likely to be struck from our hands and that most of all guarantee the possession of the whole chain. And here I, I, I make a, a, an aside because um, now I, I will describe uh, two or three enterprises uh, con connected with this view. One is the Great Ape Project, which I, I don't mention di directly, but is the Great Ape Project. And um, uh, um, la the attack that uh, is often waged against against the Great Ape Project is uh, that, uh, in a sense, it, it is still uh, humanistic uh, or speciesist and so on because it privileges um, some animals, uh, some individuals, um, strongly cognitively endowed over the rest of the other animals. I don't want to defend the position in general here and to argue for it, but I want to stress uh, that the, the basic idea behind the project is to break the species barrier. So to break the, spe break the species barrier means in Leninian terms uh, 
take a grip uh, of the, uh, the link, which most of all guarantees the possession of the whole chain. To break the species barrier in one point is to break the species barrier in general. Two current projects for focusing on the non-human great apes, as I told you, uh, and on cetaceans, uh, can exemplify this process, demanding basic human rights for the other great apes, uh, traditional victims of capitalism dynamic, dynamic in the form of experimentation by pharmaceutical companies and industrial destruction of the forests of the planet, and granting them moral and legal personhood is now made possible by the insertion of the arguments produced by rational ethics into the, once again, contradictions of an ambiv ambivalent cultural attitude that is the apex of a long history of wavering before their sim similarity and relatedness to our species. Is in this enterprise, one might also profitably build on Bourdieu's Bourdieu's diagnosis of cultural fields, according to which they are generally marked by a tendency of new entrants to adopt critical stances and to deploy strategies of subversion in order to overturn established hierarchies and gain status. This is very important. Many, many um, um, projects and uh, um, the theorizations uh, of the movement in, in uh, the recent, e recent years have capitalized on this fact that a new generation of scientists have entered the field and uh, have um, fighted against uh, the fathers, uh, the founders, uh, and have um, supported more radical and revolutionary views uh, while at the same time favoring their entrance and their higher status in the field. This is very important. Mm. Those quite apart from capitalizing on an ever more sympathet sympathetic public opinion, the animal liberation movement might here try to benefit from the conflict internal to the relevant scientific domains for from primatology to anthropology to interspecies communication and comparative psychologies, where it has become rewarding to complete the destruction of the once dominating behaviorist paradigm and to replace it with subtle anal analysis of animal, mental, and emotional life. I will tell you something about uh, this uh, just a little later. Actually, all this work is already starting to erode the paradigm so that many countries have for forbidden experimentation on our closest living relatives and some parliamentary resolutions in favor, in favor of granting legal rights to the non-human great apes have been approved. In the case of cetaceans, on the other hand, a relevant role is being played by the benign side of the globalization of international law. For, with its gradual but steady proscriptions, proscription of massacres guided by industrial profitability, the evolution of the opinion juries of nations is adumbrating cetaceans entitlement to life, thus paving the way for political pressure in favor of the articulation of the corresponding legal right. Um, as with the non-human great apes, such a pressure can benefit from the growing emphasis on the complex complexity of cetacean minds and cultures in the relevant scientific disciplines. For example, when in Helsinki, um, seven years ago, um, we arranged a, a meeting which issued in the Declaration of Cetacean, cetacean Rights, Whales uh, and Dolphins and Porpoises, um, we had the possibility to involve uh, Whitehead, uh, Hall Whitehead, who is uh, the uh, top uh, cetologist in the world. He is a very sensitive person, He's, he was certainly, was certainly involved, but he was a revolutionary intellectual in his own, in his own in his own field. He wrote with Mike Randall an article uh, entitled uh, Cultures in Whales and Dolphins. Uh, cultures. So, 
more than one culture in whales and dolphins. And this raised a debate and they were, they were attacked, but they gained a high reputation in their field with this. Um, furthermore, drawing on reflexive sociologists elucidation of the mechanism, mechanism by which political events in the presence of diverse fields pregnant with their own determinants may be potentiated by a coincidence of different crises so that mobilization can capitalize on their synchronization, the enterprise might avail itself of the energies liberated by the explosion of the environmental crisis and by the concern with global warming and the anthropocenic destruction of the ocean life, which fuel antagonistic discourses favoring a stronger conservationist stance. A sign of the recent progresses is that the almost universal sympathy for the whale wars courageously waged against the threats of non-compliant non nations such as Norway and Japan. First, uh, uh, in the past by, her, um, by um, now is uh, Captain Watson, and I don't remember, uh, Greenpeace. Before, uh, the organization uh, was Greenpeace, and then uh, it uh, de-radicalized, and Captain Watson founded his uh, own group. Uh, a further sign is the decision of India's Ministry of Environment to forbid the keeping of dolphins in captivity, supported by reference to dolphins as non-human persons. And uh, mm, another comment, uh, one cannot, can never know from where change can come. Because, for example, why in India the Minister of, of Environment for, forbade uh, the keeping of dolphins in captivity in Italy, in Italy at Genoa, they were inaugura inaugurating the new aquarium with dolphins in captivity. They were inaugurating it. So India was, okay, India has a, 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 a strange and partially religious history of attention to, to animals. But for example, in, in uh, the group which uh, uh, defends uh, whales and uh, tries to obtain that the moratorium on the killing of whales uh, uh, is uh, uplifted, uh, an attempt which is already made by Japan, supported by Norway and Island too, somehow, uh, are countries like Argentina, uh, Brazil, uh, Central, uh, South American countries, uh, while Norway, which is considered a very progressive uh, nation, uh, has resumed uh, the, the, the whaling. whaling. In both cases, uh, the one concerning the non-human great apes, as well as the one concerning cetaceans, an extension of basic equality could not only undermine the symbolic value of the species barrier against species, dispelling the social magic that produces discontinuity out, out of continuity and creating a mechanism for further wider extensions, but might also start to apply to the non-human realm that curb of unruly economic exploitation that leftist political thinkers invoke only for the human domain. Uh, uh, this is another important point. Apart from favoring a form of alliance building, alliance building that catalyzes uh, the, rather than begging for the support of differently minded but synergetic groups, uh, and, and I'll go on later. So, uh, it, it's not that uh, I and other authors think that uh, it, in, it is not worthwhile to work with other groups. We think that it's important to build uh, our strong uh, autonomous movement and after to work with other movements. And if we can impose our goals, we will not uh, go with, the, uh, with our head uh, in uh, our hand uh, trying to minimize our goals, uh, hoping that this can uh, um, urge other groups uh, to work with us. 
if we work uh, uh, in, in, in a, a very uh, incisive way, we can catalyze, for example, uh, the, the declaration on cetaceans, uh, cetacean rights has been uh, publish, publicized, approved and so on by environmental groups. So the alliance was there, but we started the work uh, and we did not minimize our goals uh, and they joined us. Okay. Apart from this, uh, um, <coughs> uh, these uh, this first attempts uh, could also offer Iket Nunc a glimpse of what a possible zoopolis might look like. For from the reality of present marine sanctuaries could arise a sort of sovereignty for cetaceans over the ocean they inhabit. And in the case of the non-human great apes who, after long captivity, must keep living with, uh, among us, a first experiment in citizenship might be done, as is foreshadowed by the various initiatives engaging the legal domain, with the aim of changing the juridical status of imprisoned individuals by obtaining from the, for them legal personhood which recently culminated, uh, I, I think you heard of it, in the liberation in Argentine, Argentina of the young chimpanzee Cecilia, who has been the first non-human animal freed by a writ of habeas corpus formerly applied only to human beings anywhere in the world. Cecilia has been uh, uh, liberated by a writ, uh, the writ of um, uh, Judge uh, Ale Alejandra Mauricio in Mendoza uh, and after uh, I, I think a couple of months uh, of preparation she was sent to a sanctuary in, uh, at Sorocaba in Brazil and it's a sanctuary because of course she cannot live free uh, she cannot uh, be uh, introduced in, in her real life environment, but there she is free and protected and, and this is really the first time that uh, a non-human animal is uh, seen as an uh, uh, unduly imprisoned individual. Actually the theme of, uh, uh, sorry, Curison, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> collapsing. What time is it please? I don't want to uh, because I can cut um, something. Sorry? So it's just uh, the end. Uh, okay, so mm, if I can cut something, I wanted to. Mm, it's a pity, but because <laughs> it's a pity, not, it's a pity because they can offer other. Uh, elements for discussion. Mm. Let me cho choose just... Uh, okay. Okay, I will tell you a couple of things which uh, um, synthesize uh, what I will not read. Really? Yes. Sincerely? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, actually, the theme looking for contradictions, uh, as always. Actually, the theme of citizenship could play a role in another locus of contradiction that has been explored ever since uh, the movements in section. Joyce Tischler, uh, had, uh, had in, um, in uh, San Francisco, I think, in the Bay Area, uh, working in the Bay Area, had uh, had already uh, proposed a, a, a model of guardianship for cats uh, and dogs. Uh, that is uh, the realm of companion animals who are in many countries variously protected and sometimes even considered in, course, in courts as family members. For example, when judges should decide uh, uh, with whom of the two uh, exposes uh, the cat or the dog should live in the future. This happens in Italy, but it happens also in the States. I, I read articles about this uh, in the States. 
uh, with the consequence that persistent pressure is exerted on the current status of property. With respect to such a realm, there is, despite the fact that the public intellectual debate is just beginning, the advantage of the possible support of a wide, extremely motivated and easily mobilizable uh, section of public opinion. Uh, as critical theorists emphasized, in all these enterprises, radicalism has much to gain from legitimate political activity, uh, as well as from a rec reflexive use of the existing legal frameworks and of the democratic resources which are the outcome of past struggles. Focused projects of this kind, however, cannot remain isolated, as they are only the tips of the iceberg of the global struggle for the eradication of all animal exploitation. Of course, when we think of uh, factory farming, when we think uh, of the numbers uh, and of the, 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 the power behind uh, the animal industrial complex, uh, uh, we can think, uh, okay, it's important to start to break the species barrier, to introduce uh, some non-human non animals uh, into the circle of equality, but we can be really discouraged. And this is, of course, normal, unfortunately. Uh, and to fight such a struggle where a direct radical intervention is often impossible, a further concept on which the Frank Frankfurtians elaborated might possibly offer a cue, the idea of a long march through the institutions. Uh, this idea, sorry, but I cannot keep this on my ears. I cannot, okay. I'm sorry, but... This idea comes uh, from Rudi Dutke, a leader of the students' movement in Germany, and was uh, um, uh, revived by Herbert Marcuse in the famous lectures in Berlin. Uh, the idea of a long march through the, the institutions. This, the sense of this policy is clear. If society cannot be directly changed, it should be modified in a mediated way by influencing its ganglions, that is, by working against established institutions while working in them. Manifestly central to the strategy is a clever use of theory, the altering of cultural hegemony through institutional entryism. Entryism is also a, a, a concept of the left. Entryism means uh, uh, to penetrate other realities and to influence, influence them. It was, I think, uh, a, a Trotskyan term, I think. The penetration into social case, casemates uh, like the publishing system, magistracy, and especially, especially university. Uh, key institution, institutions in the training of counter cadres, as well as through concerted efforts to create counter institutions. Not only we should enter into the institutions, but we should try to create counter institutions. A process of this kind is already underway, and expanding it should not be too problematic for a social entity, our movement, whose cornerstone is academic, and whose scholars might, along Bourdieu's lines, build up a collective intellectual able to place multiple competencies in the service of the cause. As mentioned, and it, worth, it is worth emphasizing again, political subversion presupposes cognitive subversion, and in particular the masking of the process of euphemization through which the dominant make violence unrecognizable by conferring on it the appearances of the natural. Uh, it's natural that animals are second-class beings. It's natural for women to stay home and uh, uh, not to work and not to have sex freely like uh, men and so on. Um, the, the appearances of the natural and from the very efforts of the defenders of the status quo even when they hold all the keys to power to produce an incessant propaganda 
flooding the public with the reinstatements of the doxa, it can be inferred how vulnerable oppressive relations are to the challenges of heretical discourse. Uh, if you notice, uh, if there is a controversy, a controversy in society where there is, there is a, a, a weaker party uh, and uh, uh, a, a struggle within this weaker par party group and the majority, it starts a, a campaign which uh, uh, prevents uh, the weaker party even from talking. I could give you examples, uh, uh, for example, uh, d don't, don't think of the content, but it's an example, of course. In Italy, there is a debate about vaccinations, and there, and there is a small minority against uh, forced, uh, against the, the obligation to uh, vaccinate uh, uh, children, and uh, uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical complex, uh, uh, the political forces, uh, the conservative uh, uh, representatives and so on, who are, of course, defending the idea that uh, uh, parents should be obliged to vaccinate uh, their children. It's, it has become almost impossible to defend uh, uh, the idea uh, to, to, to attack the idea that you should be obliged to use vaccinations. And some people working in this area told me that there are many, many demonstrations against this, and these are never covered by the media. So this means that uh, uh, the powerful are somehow afraid of the heretical discourse. They must silence it. Also, if they have the Kalashnikov here to, uh, to shut us down if we are too unruly, they must destroy the heretical discourse. Um, in parallel with what happened in other political spaces, the theoretical dismantling of the justifications of the paradigm of human superiority resolutely, conduct, resolutely, resolutely conduct, conducted in defiance of all the forms of compulsory discursivity that govern the conditions under which political claims on behalf of animals can be made, above all the requirement of a preliminary kowtowing to the humanist ideology, the idea uh, comes from the feminists, uh, no, from feminist reflection. Um, the, 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 the idea of the cons compulsory discursivity. Uh, but if you think uh, this question of the kowtowing uh, before defending animals in front of humanism is really, really impressive because most often people who defend animals, not maybe, of course, the academic speaking in the university and so on, but publicly defending animals, say, oh, I, uh, I respect humans, I speak, I'm not anti-humanist, but of course also animals. The, the, the compulsory discursivity imposes uh, to uh, express uh, uh, a sort of uh, um, appeasement, uh, appeasement uh, with humanism before declaring war in the name of animals. Um, and based all, no, not only on direct argumentation, but also on the deconstruction and reconstruction of toxic conventions, uh, the prime example is, of course, the introduction of new terms such as speciesism and non-humans might seriously challenge and influence uh, through a top-down process the public acceptance of practices like, like flesh-eating and using non-humans as instruments for work or research. Uh, there is a possibility to fight against the habitus, fight in a certain way, dismantling the drugs uh, about uh, the major areas of animal exploitation. It's not the possibility of shutting down this institution. It's the possibility of trying to uh, undermine their accept accepta acceptability, sorry, and their, uh, their presence in society. Um, 
such a theoretical dismantling should also, and maybe especially, I'm working on this now, target those purportedly radical leftist approaches that confine themselves to advancing patronizing comments on the complex economy of relations between uh, humans and animals. So the complete phrase is the, the complex and not always edifying uh, economic of relations between humans and animals. And this is uh, the, the, the present star of biopolitics, uh, Giorgio Gamben, uh, or condescending remarks on the suffering of non-humans, this is Slavoj Žižek, instead of confronting the apex of capitalist exploitation in such systems as the animal industrial complex. I think we must uh, attack uh, those who declare themselves uh, radical and uh, uh, who pretend to play an oppositional role and put them uh, and force them to confront their inability to see this reality. Of course, to be effective, as well as to help to ensure that militant mobilization might produce effective political campaigns, this enterprise should be accompanied by another fundamental under undertaking, the carrying on to processes of discursive identification of the social actors, of the symbolic work that is the precursor of mobilization, mobilization itself. Such a work that was clearly instrumental to the, to the social construction of classes and that centers around establishing a group as a relevant cultural and social force at once expressed and constituted by theoretical views, political stances, constituents and representatives is even more relevant for a movement, movement which, in as much as it precursors tended to be seen as conservative crutches of the established order, or even as, as the model of those marginal organizations which nobody could take seriously, seriously, questo è anarent, this is anarent, is in definite need to assert itself, itself as a radical, political endeavor, pursuing institutional changes. By the way, a propos of the enduring discrepancy between the movement and what persists of the traditional forms of animal defense, there is a further suggestion that can be drawn from the notion of a long march, the one that you have mm, used with respect to the prevailing institutions. For when they do not directly collide collide, sorry, with the movement's agenda, as mentioned, the request advanced by conservative groups have the effect of raising the issue and can even succeed in altering the institutional framework, as, uh, this is an important Bourdieuian point, as due to bureaucracy propensity to perpetuate itself, once agency focusing on animal protection are established, they will be there to stay and in order to last will tend to play a progressive role. Mm. The creation of, um, for example, Milan uh, uh, had a, a, a specific uh, appointment uh, uh, for the defender of animals uh, uh, and uh, of course uh, there are institutional, small institutional frameworks uh, to which, which, which we can, uh, one can address uh, to receive help or, or legal protection. Uh, since uh, these bureaucratic and moderate forms of uh, uh, institu institutionalization of animal protection employ people, uh, since uh, they offer possibilities to people, those people want to go on working in these areas and tend to extend uh, their, their control to help those who want uh, um, their intervention and so on. Uh, in this light, it might be suggested that an ideologically confident animal liberation movement could consider setting aside a merry, merely principled approach in favor of the more strategic idea of a further form of entry through which the work of conservative, conservative groups can be overseen and perhaps also influenced. 
Finally, this is a word that you will appreciate, appreciate to hear. F f sorry, finally, a related point concerning unity. It is often regretted that the animal liberation movement is split by personal and political antagonism. This may be true, but it's true of any other collective social agent. The problem is rather that, disregarding its capacity to organize itself, the movement has not generated a global, coordinated network able to establish connections among the various centers into which it is divided. If developed, such a network not only could make initiatives more conspicuous by bringing into existence in an instituted form a collective collective agent is there to present only in a potential state, but could, also, but could also play the crucial role of providing a locus for the clash between opposing views. For it is mainly in such clashes that political strategies can be debated and tested. Thank you very much.